So Avatar 2 came out this December. I was counting down the days for it. I was so excited. And particularly with this movie, seeing it as many times as possible in theaters kind of felt like a must. We saw it once and then the next day I was like, I kind of already want to go back and see it again. And so we did. And then like a few days later, I was like, I kind of need to see it again. And so we did. And then I was like, I need to see it again. And so we did. And every time a few days would pass, I would just feel that post Pandora depression setting in and I'd be like, I have to go back. I'm kind of feeling like I need to see it again tonight, right now. It's like I just need to go bathe in this movie every few days. It's like the only way I can rest. I'm at the point where I have seen Avatar, as you might be able to tell from this shirt, for 24 hours. I have spent 24 hours in the world of Pandora and boy oh boy, I'm not ashamed of it. I, I liked it. I, I think it was a good decision. It's interesting how your perception of a movie can change over the course of multiple viewings. I mean, that's not a particularly deep observation. Of course, our perceptions change. But like when I first saw Avatar The Way of Water, I thought that the first Avatar was probably a better movie. I really did think that the first Avatar was more focused. It was more thematically cohesive and The Way of Water was great, but maybe not quite as good as the original. Now, I'm actually on the side that I think Way of Water is much better than the original and maybe one of the greatest blockbusters ever made, question mark? For whatever reason, I still have like plot brain where whenever I'm watching a movie, I'm kind of thinking like, all right, where are we in the story? Or like, what act are we in? I think of things through those terms and I don't love that I do, but the, the first time I saw Way of Water, I was kind of thinking like that and I was lost in terms of where the story was heading or what the pacing was like. And I did feel like it sagged in the middle because I was like, where exactly are we going with this whale stuff? And the second viewing, knowing where it was going, I was just able to kind of sit back and enjoy the ride. And that's how I felt with every subsequent viewing. It's just felt more and more like rest every single time. So I did think I should probably tell you about the theatrical experiences that I've had because I've seen it in pretty much every format possible to see it in. First time I saw the movie, and I'm ashamed to say this, but it was kind of my only option at the time. It was in 2D standard. Now granted, it was standard with a laser projector, so it looked great. But my immediate thought after seeing the movie the first time was, Wow, I made a big mistake seeing that in 2D the first time. <laughs> it was also with the high frame rate the first time. And admittedly on the first viewing, I was like, I am not sold on this high frame rate thing. And I found out later that Cameron actually said that he doesn't think the high frame rate goes really well with 2D. He made it to function symbiotically with the 3D. And that was my thought upon the first viewing. I was like, this would work much better in 3D, I think. And so the next day I went back and saw it in 3D with high frame rate and it did work better. And I really enjoyed it that time. After that, I saw it three times in IMAX 3D. That was without the high frame rate. And so I did get the contrast of like seeing it in 24 FPS versus high FPS. Um, and it was nice, like, I don't know. It, it felt more like a normal movie in some ways, seeing it in 24 FPS. But ultimately, after my many viewings, my actual takeaway is that I much prefer it with the high frame rate. I think it adds something otherworldly to it. So then after I'd seen it uh, once in 2D, once in 3D, three times in IMAX with just the 24 FPS, I went back and saw it at a different theater at a different IMAX with IMAX 3D with a laser projector. And I think that was probably my best viewing of the movie. It was magnificent. The, the crisp laser looked amazing. Seeing it in high frame rate with the laser, with the 3D, with the IMAX was perfection. And I think, you know, I mean, it was made for that format. So it looked the best in that format. Now we're getting into the funky formats because these were the ones where I was like, that's an option. All right, I guess I'll go for it. So I first saw it in 4DX. That was my seventh viewing. 4DX was the most ridiculous thing I have ever experienced in my entire life. And I loved every second of it. I guess like the many 4D effects are meant to immerse you more in the movie. And admittedly, I was not immersed more in the movie. I was just thinking about the 4D effects and laughing at them, but they they were cool sometimes, like when Neytiri shoots those insanely strong arrows at guys, and I can watch her do that like a hundred times over, it's so fun. They like jab you in the back when she like shoots the guy with arrows and you like feel them like whiz past your ear with like an air cannon next to your head. So that's fun. And like when they're shooting machine guns, your whole chair is rocketing. There's that scene where Spider falls off the tree in the first act. And they like shake you so hard that I really thought I was gonna die. It did work really well in some sequences though. I mean, I enjoyed being misted with water every time someone went into the water, like that was fun. And when I remember when Payakan jumps out of the water in the third act, like they just drenched you. And that was really fun too. Uh, but 
actually probably the best use of the 4D effect. I'm not explaining this very well. They move your seat. Like it's like almost like a theme park ride. The best use of it was when people were underwater on like the Elus or the skim wings and you really did feel this sense of like floating and swimming with them. So 4D was ridiculous. I would never recommend someone to see it for the first time in 4D, but since it was my seventh viewing, <laughs> I was like, I'll give anything a shot. And then after that, I went and saw it in Screen X, which is an even more bizarre format. Screen X is basically like the modern take on Cinemascope or Panovision, where the screen is panoramic and it goes across the entire theater, like onto the sidewalls. And so, I was very anxious to see how they were gonna do this because obviously Cameron didn't shoot the movie for Screen X, he shot it for IMAX 3D, and that's why it looks the best in IMAX 3D. But they did it this way, and I saw it, and I was the only one in the theater, and boy oh boy, it was the worst viewing by far. To start with, the Screen X viewing was only in 2D with no high frame rate, so it was already at a disadvantage there. But then, imagine this. You've got the main movie in the center screen. Then you've got kind of a little bit of a gap, and then you have these two other screens on the sides. They're not exactly synced with the primary screen. Like sometimes they lag a little bit and sometimes they like jitter a little bit. But to make matters worse, the two side screens are like infinitely lower resolution. Like sometimes it legitimately looked like 240p. Sometimes they look like PlayStation 2 graphics. And so the funniest part is, you'll see like a character go off screen from the primary frame, which looks amazing as always. And then immediately once they get over to the side screen, they look like a PS2 render of themselves. And it's so funny. I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. And the best part is often the screen doesn't even fully line up with the other screens. And it's like not even connected at all. And from what I gather, that's the case in most Screen X theaters. Like this wasn't just a personal thing with my theater. Like this happens all the time. So it was clear that they like outsource these visuals to some other company because they looked infinitely lower quality. Sometimes it legitimately looked like, like when there was a, one of those Sea Wasp helicopters or a Banshee on the side screen, it would sometimes look like it was just a PNG image being dragged across the screen. It wasn't fully in sync with the main image. And then to make matters worse, it's only there for like one third of the movie. It's clear that they chose the scenes that were the easiest to extend to the side screens because like most of the scenes are the stuff like with water and bushes and trees around and the stuff in like the village they don't do it with. So at the moment when you'll finally feel sort of like you're being immersed in the, in the movie, like you're like, oh, it's wow, it's so immersive. It's surrounding me. It'll like cut and just abruptly you're back to the normal aspect ratio and the walls on the side of you that were previously showing all this image are now totally black. And so it's like a tiny image in front of you now, or at least that's what it feels like. So needless to say, I don't recommend Screen X. It was bad. 4DX, if it's your seventh viewing, I recommend. But if you haven't seen the movie yet, first of all, what are you doing here? But I would recommend seeing it for the very first time in IMAX 3D high frame rate with a laser projector, if you can spare it. I don't know, all these things are arbitrary, but they're really not, because I think they add a lot to the experience. So that was my eight viewings, 24 hours on Pandora, the mission was complete, but to make matters even worse, I decided I had to go see it for round nine, just because, I don't know, I just thought I felt like I, I was really in the mood for it. Full disclosure, on the ninth viewing, there are things that are boring to me at this point, especially after having seen it nine times over the course of like one month. That's, it's extreme to say the least. And every time they get to the sequence with the whale hunting, where they're like hunting the Tulkun and they kill the mother and it's like the saddest thing in the world. That's always when I leave to go to the bathroom and I just kind of hang out in the bathroom for a little bit, just cause like, I don't know, the scene's really sad and I tend to get bored around that moment and I don't wanna watch it again. Um, but other than that, I'm like dialed in for most of the movie. Like, I'm almost never bored other than that. There was a pretty prominent criticism of the first Avatar, which now a lot of people have applied to the second Avatar, which is this idea that like, oh, it's only good in theaters, bro. Once you see it at home, you realize how bad it is and you're not nearly as engaged. And that experience you had in the theater was just like the emotions of the moment. And when you get home and see it objectively, it's actually bad. And let me unpack all the ways that's wrong. First of all, you're right. It's not as good at home as it is in theaters. We've established that and I agree, but here's the thing. 
that's proof to me that it's a good piece of art that was made for the medium that it's meant to be presented in. I think for whatever reason, like all art is now viewed as content that we should be able to stream whenever we want on whatever device we want. And it should be just as good on my phone while I'm sitting on the toilet as it would be in a movie theater when it first came out. And that's just not the type of movie that James Cameron is interested in making. We've developed like this bizarrely possessive control freak streak in us where we want to be able to box up the art that we just watched and put it on our shelf and pause it whenever we want and fast forward whenever we want and watch it on whatever device we want, whenever we want and cut it up and put clips on YouTube and nitpick every single thing and just hold the experience in our hands and do whatever we want with it. But the thing is, Cameron is working with things that are so much more transcendent than that. And I think he has no interest in giving us that power. I want to have a direct relationship with this bigger thing, right? What those people are doing for me is creating a scenario in which I have no control. I can't just pick up the remote and stop it because of my social contract with everybody else there. And it's, it's making the decision to have an experience over which you have no control, knowing that it will flood into you with greater impact. Many people would see the fact that Avatar cannot be re-experienced the same way at home as a flaw, but to me, that's why I've been to see it nine times in the theater, because it's this temporary experience that I know I'm gonna miss when it's gone. And there's something sacred about that. There's something sacred about sitting in a theater and going like, this isn't gonna be here forever, and I wanna soak in this moment because I know that even when I watch it at home, it won't be exactly the same. I often compare James Cameron's movies to kind of like Broadway shows where it's like, yes, you can watch the cast recording of a Broadway show at home. You can listen to the cast recording. You can watch a recording that PBS did and aired on TV, but it's never gonna be the same thing as seeing the show live. And no one faults theater productions for that. Like we don't say, oh, the theater, that, that stage play was actually bad because it's not as good in the PBS TV recording as it was in person live. Like, no, like we accept that the experience has this sort of transcendence to it when you see it live that will never be replicated again and that only happens in that moment. And Cameron's movies aren't exactly like that because yes, they've been recorded and they're replayed in theaters over and over again, but it is like there's something transient about it and there's something sacred about knowing that seeing it in IMAX 3D in that moment, I'm gonna tell my kids about that. It's special, it's temporal, it's fleeting, and it's made for the medium of theaters, not for content that will just populate another streaming service and give it reasons for people to subscribe. I gotta say, James Cameron is my hero. I, I think the guy is amazing. I don't know if I would want to work on one of his sets. I don't even know if I would enjoy being his friend, but I think as a figurehead, he is something else and endlessly inspiring to me. As the Navi say, well, Nati Kamea, I see you. I mean, the idea that he spent 13 years working on a sequel that everyone mocked him for making, is just like really satisfying, especially when you see that sequel make $2 billion. You know, as a fellow artist, the idea of someone dedicating themselves to finishing something over 13 years and not giving up on it, like, I've been working on a couple of projects for three years now, and that seems like eternity. I'm like, I can't believe this isn't done yet. But 13 years working on the same project that everyone's mocking you for making? It's amazing to me. It's so inspiring. It's like, whoa, he, he finished it and it's great. The thing is like Cameron makes things for the medium of movie theaters and he's very vocal about that. But people recently have been making him out to be like this hoity-toity pretentious artist because he thinks people should see things in a theater. And he's not that. James Cameron is a man of the people. He has been making crowd-pleasing blockbusters his whole life and he does it better than anyone. I saw this tweet recently that said, a generation raised exclusively on insincere corporate products thinks anything that considers itself art is pretentious. And yeah, like, I mean, people have been doing this with Spielberg recently. Steven Spielberg, the guy who has made some of the most mainstream movies of all time, I love him, but he's not like some edgy indie artist. He is one of the most popular and mainstream crowd-pleasing filmmakers of all time. And people have been like, after the Fablemans, oh, he's like, 
He's such a pretentious guy now. Like what? James Cameron is a man of the people, but he has one crucial difference from lots of the other quote unquote populist directors today. And that's that he is fully willing to acknowledge that he knows better than the audience what they actually want. Cameron is not interested in crowd pleasing. He's not interested in just pleasing the audience momentarily with something they think is like, oh wow, that name got dropped, or oh wow, that's an Easter egg. He's interested in satisfying the audience on a deep level, and he knows how to do it better than the audience even knows what they want. So many directors today are chasing after the high of the movies that they watched in their childhood and learning all the wrong lessons from the movies from their childhood, imitating the wrong things. Cameron has learned all the right lessons. But what are we gonna do, stop? No, you know, I mean, if I'm a, if I'm a dinosaur, I'm, I'm gonna get killed by the comet. I'm not gonna just give up. So we've gotten this far into the conversation and we still haven't even really talked about the movie. Uh, I love it, it's so good. I love Avatar The Way of Water, it's amazing. Speaking of this sort of insincere corporate product concept, I think sincerity has been lacking in a major way from movies in the past few years, especially mainstream blockbusters. And yes, maybe Marvel epitomizes that the best with all of their self-aware humor. You're not the one with the hammer. It's Thor, we get confused a lot. Similar body types. Jane? But it's not just them. It's a lot of different things that have been sort of inserting this sense of self-awareness and bathos and mocking yourself and being like, ha ha, aren't we so dumb? And I've really missed blockbusters that know how to be epic and know how to be sincere and know how to be earnest. And this year was a majorly welcome return to form with that. Top Gun Maverick, RRR, Dune, of course that was the year before, The Batman, it's been wonderful. The thing is, the sheer sincerity of Avatar, the first and the second movie, makes it really easy to dunk on. But it also makes it really friggin' cool and overwhelming and awe-inspiring. The scene where Loak is swimming with Pyacon and it's just this beautiful musical score and he's like touching his hand to the top of the waves as they're swimming near the top and it looks, but the shot's upside down, and you're like, whoa, and that's the top of the wall. How's he, whoa, it's amazing. And I'm just like sitting there in awe every single time, because it's like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, and there's not a self-aware joke in sight. It's kind of like when Maverick hits Mach 10 at the start of Top Gun Maverick, where it's just like, he's the fastest man alive. This is beautiful and awe-inspiring and amazing, and there's nothing to undercut it. I'm just seeing a human being doing one of the most amazing things a human being has ever done. And I know it's fiction, but it's inspiring the sense of awe in me and like inspiration and bizarre like reverence for like being alive. And the fact that there's no joke undercutting it is beautiful. I feel that way about like almost all of The Way of Water. It, I feel like it's just that feeling for like three hours straight. People often kind of reduce the appeal of Avatar to, oh, it's just eye candy or it's just nice visuals or yeah, oh, it looks nice, but what about the story, bro? And I feel like, I don't know, it, it's so reductive to me because even when I praise the movie, like yes, there are technical achievements within the movie that are amazing but they all are in service of a deeper experience. It's not just, oh, that looks nice. It's this experience is powerful. And there's even a sense of joy to the technical achievements that just makes them so fun to watch. Like you see something like Cameron putting the character of Spider in the movie, right? You've got a movie that otherwise would be entirely blue people, all CGI motion capture characters. And then Cameron goes, Hey, why don't we just put a little freaky white boy in there? And also he's live action and, and he's gonna interact with the CGI characters seamlessly. And we're not even gonna explain how we did it. Like, he's just having fun with that. And so much of the movie is that. So many of the technical achievements are that. It's Cameron going, could we do that? Let's try it. Oh, we did it. Okay, yeah, awesome. And you go, whoa, they did it. That's awesome. But it's also like invisible too, like it's, it's, it's joyful and beautiful and awesome, but it's not flexing itself. Like, it's not like, oh wow, look, we can do this. Like, I've talked to numerous people who don't even understand how amazing it is that Spider, the live action character, is interacting with these motion capture characters because it never calls attention to itself. It's completely invisible, but it's also like one of the most amazing visual effects ever put to screen and it's just never explained or addressed. And the fact that this stuff is experiential is why Cameron is able to just like, casually toss out spoilers for the fifth movie. And it doesn't matter because these movies are not built on like, oh, if you spoil the information that's going to be dispensed in the post credit scene, that it's not even worth watching. 
It's like, no, I could know the entire plot of what's gonna happen in Avatar 3, and I would still be probably amazed by the experience because it's just about the experiential magic and wonder of it that can only be experienced in a theater. It's not the type of thing that you can read the Wikipedia summary and understand. When I turned in the script for four, the studio executive wrote me an email that said, holy f I love this clip of Cameron talking about beauty and wonder, and then he talks about plot. People forget to put beauty into a film. There's a lot of snark, there's a lot of sarcasm, there's a lot of cutesy jokes, therefore diluting the sense of stakes, the, the sense of jeopardy. I go straight at just being earnest. If there's jeopardy, it's, it's real, people could die, and you like what you see? Let's just hang out for a bit, you know? Let's not rush through this just because of artificial concepts like plot. The sheer contempt with which he says the word plot is amazing to me, because it's like this thing that he just has to get past to get to the real meat of what he wants to do, which is just the experience. But even though Cameron hates plot and doesn't like obsessing over plot because he really wants to focus on the experiential magic that only film can provide, He's also really, really good and effective at plot. Titanic has an immaculate three act structure and The Way of Water is the same way. I mean, it's divided into three acts in like the most overt way that you could be and the transitions between the acts work so well. When Cameron's movies start to culminate into their third act, it's like ascending to a higher level of existence. Like when the Titanic hits the iceberg and you know everything's about to go crazy, it's just like, I can't contain my excitement in that moment. I'm like, here it comes, the third act. It's gonna be amazing. Or like in The Way of Water, when the kids get captured and the parents are all grabbing the weapons and the Navi are going out on the skim wings and getting ready to go to battle. Like, I am dialed in every time. It is, man. I mean, I've seen the movie nine times and sometimes I'm getting bored around that point in the movie and then it gets to that third act turn and I'm just, in. It's not even exactly about like setups and payoffs, but there's something that Cameron's able to do where he establishes all of these different components in the first two acts of his movie, just like a bunch of different things, and then he brings everything together in the third act in a way that is insanely satisfying. Pyakon and Loak, everyone learning to hold their breath underwater, learning to ride the skim wings and the elu, Spider's relationship with Quaritch, the whale hunting ship, and the crab suits, and Quaritch's team, and their banshees, and the Metkayina, and Kiri's magic Awa powers. It all comes together in the third act in a way that is so gratifying to watch and leaves nothing out. Everything that's been swirling around in the first two acts finally comes to a head in that third act and just culminates in this insanely gratifying conclusion. And man, I mean, this is not just the third act, this is everything, but like, this man knows how to direct action. Like, and it's not just like excessive showy things like, oh, this action scene is a one -er for some reason. No, it's invisible, you know? The immaculate editing and the immaculate choreography and blocking and the immaculate sound design and everything, you don't even notice any of it because you're so dialed into the moment of the action, but it's so, so, so excellent. Especially with that third act, I notice every time how tactile and real and physical it feels. You know, they're, they're scavenging weapons off of corpses and they're running out of ammo mid fight. And so then they have to switch to a knife and Neytiri shoots an arrow through a guy and then picks the guy up by the arrow and shoots the arrow again into another guy. Like what? Jake has to find a spear in the wreckage and he takes off his vest to strangle Quaritch with the vest, and he dodges out of the way of one of the attacks, and Quaritch gets the knife stuck in the grate of the ship, and then he twists the knife, and the knife falls out of his hand, and then they're underwater, and they're strangling each other, and it's like so good and so raw and better than almost anything in even an R-rated movie. The characters here are so fun to watch. I mean, I dare anyone after The Way of Water to tell me that they don't remember Jake Sully's name or that they don't think that he's an iconic action hero. Even more than in the first movie, I, I think in this one, there's a real sense that Cameron just gets so much joy out of working with actors. And if you listen to interviews, he talks about that all the time. Stephen Lang as Quaritch, Sam Worthington as Jake, Sigourney Weaver as Kiri, Zoe Saldana as Neytiri. Everyone is just having a ball doing this role. Like they're just having the time of their lives. And especially I think Stephen Lang as Quaritch has so much charisma this time around, even more than the first movie. Like I'm all in with him as the overarching villain for the whole series. He's just a joy to watch on screen. Somewhat problematically, uh, James Cameron's self insert character in the first Avatar was probably Jake Sully and that's fine, whatever. But 
I think the thing that makes The Way of Water even better than the original Avatar is that in this one, his self-insert character is a 14-year-old girl who just really loves water and fish and sand and fish and water and sand. And that's James Cameron, man. And this is the thing that like, you know, we can talk about the fact that this is still technically a corporate product, right? I mean, it's distributed by Disney and it's not like this is like the savior of all movies, right? We still need indie stuff. And this is not what should be all of what's in theaters, you know? Like uh, there's still plenty of conversations to be had about blockbusters dominating the market and all this kind of stuff. But in terms of what a blockbuster should be and how a blockbuster should use the money that it's given to full effect, I think Avatar is the best example of that. And even more notably, I also think it's a wonderful example of a blockbuster produced by a corporation that still feels like it has the distinct and inseparable DNA of its creator in it. I'm not a huge believer in auteur theory. Like I believe that most movies are made as the product of a bunch of people's efforts and Avatar is certainly the same way. But man, these movies make me believe in auteur theory because like James Cameron made these. These are James Cameron's movies. You just feel his fingerprints on everything. I just realized I've been reading the word auteur uh, online all this time and I've never really said it out loud. And I think it's actually pronounced aut auteur. Auteur. That doesn't sound right to me. Anyway, I believe it. And a big part of it is that you can just feel Cameron's childlike ecstatic passion radiating through every frame in a contagious way. And obviously these movies are about a fictional planet, but the fictional planet has so much in common with our real planet that it's able to kind of steal past our inhibitions of what we would take as preachy environmentalism or all this kind of stuff and just give us a story that's really satisfying. And then you walk out of the theater and you go, wait a minute, the coral reefs in our world are just as amazing as the ones on Pandora. Like, why don't we protect them, you know? I left Avatar The Way of Water with an intense desire to go to the aquarium, and I did, and it was beautiful. And I went swimming afterward too, and that was also wonderful. And I was sitting here like, water's amazing, man. Boats are amazing. I can't believe they float on the water. That's so cool. And fish, they can like breathe underwater, man. It's like so cool. And there's like these giant fish, like whale sharks that I saw at the aquarium. And it's so cool. And I just can't believe we get to exist in a world that's this beautiful. And like, that all happened because I saw Avatar 2. Thank you, James Cameron. And I think it's primarily because Cameron so often allows for the experience of awe in his storytelling. It's not about creating a consistent Wikipedia summary that's interesting to read. The Wikipedia summaries for both of these movies' plots are very simple, but the experience is the message and the medium is the message. And it's made in a way that is inseparable from being experienced in that theatrical medium. And that I think is beautiful. And it feels like James Cameron is whispering in your ear. Okay, that's creepy. He's saying to you in a gentle way, let me show you something amazing. <sighs> yeah, I loved it. I, I think it's also, I said this at the beginning, but like whenever I find myself rewatching a movie over the course of a certain season and just watching it again and again and kind of resting in that movie, I often start to notice things in the movie that really stick out to me as like, oh, maybe that's why I was resonating with it so hard. One thing that's really struck me with watching this over and over has been the relationship between Loak and Natayam, the older brother and the younger brother. I think watching them argue, like there's, there's sort of the... The older brother, Natayam, is this sort of pleasing his parents. He's the perfect child. He's the perfect son. And Loak is kind of the, the black sheep of the family. He's making these decisions that are risky and bold and stupid sometimes. And I was suddenly hit by like, oh, this is kind of like the inside of me. Like, I have been Natayam for most of my life. And yet there's a sense of sort of wanting to be Loak sometimes. Like, and go and make my own decision that might disappoint my parents. And maybe that's the thing that's been drawing me to it. I think similarly, my wife Debbie realized that one of the things that was really deeply resonating with her, part of it was our own story. Like both of us have resonated with the Avatar movies in a major way because we are a cross-cultural marriage. And so there's that sense of sort of embodying another person's culture, learning what things mean in their culture, learning how to inhabit a new place that is not your home. Like that's very relatable for us and has spoken to us in very personal ways. And specifically this movie, right, is like the idea of a family moving to a new home. And that's been kind of our story in the past year. But also one of the things that spoke to her was like we saw in the past year, 
a lot of the drama unfolded with the Ukraine war stuff in Czech Republic. Uh, her dad was ferrying refugees from the Ukrainian border into Czech Republic to be able to you know, start a new life in Czech Republic for the time being. And her town is now filled with Ukrainian refugees who are having to find jobs and having to settle with their families and having to learn Czech and having to find their own communities again. And that's been heartbreaking to see and difficult to see and beautiful to see in some ways. So that was something that resonated with her deeply watching Avatar was this idea of a family uprooted by war and having to go to a different tribe and learn their ways and become accustomed to that new culture. That reminded her a lot of what the Ukrainian refugees have had to do coming to her village in Czech Republic. And these are kind of the things that like, you only start to notice when you've watched a movie nine times. And I'm not proposing that you need to watch every movie nine times, but I do think that the practice of meditating on the movies that you watch for a while and kind of letting them seep into your soul before you watch the next thing and kind of just move on, is really beautiful and beneficial sometimes. And I've learned so much about myself and what moves me and what, you know, I think sometimes something divine is trying to say to me through just sitting with a thing and maybe watching it again and going, what is hitting me so strong about this? And why do I want to watch it again? And with Avatar, it's been so many things. And I am deeply grateful that it has been out in this time of my life because it's been beautiful. So yes. I survived 24 hours watching Avatar 2, and I liked it. I, I really did. Thank you for being here for this video. If you'd like to listen to audio reviews of other movies, including Avatar The Way of Water, which I put out like a month ago on Patreon, you can go to the Patreon. That's that's where I do that, and I've been doing it more recently. I. That's all I have to say. Please comment your favorite creature from Avatar The Way of Water below. Would you rather ride a Tulkoon, an Elu, or a Skimwing? I'm kind of partial to the Skimwings, I think. I mean, they look obviously the most terrifying, but like, they're really cool. I mean, I don't know, I just think it's really cool. I'll be starting a new podcast soon. Um, more details to follow on the Patreon with that. But until then, thanks for watching this video and I hope I said that right. Can I show you something real quick? I just want to show you some fun stuff that I saw in the visual dictionary. Look at this. Okay, I, I got this um, recently because I thought it was funny. Uh, there is, there's something deeply funny about like the deep lore of Avatar. Some of it's quite funny, but there's some interesting stuff in here. For instance, look at these pages of Captain Mick Scoresby and Captain Ian Garvey, the whale hunting guys. I just think these are really funny images. Like they just look so discontent, both of them. Like they were forced to pose for this. It's just really funny. They also have um, full names for the recom team, the, the Navi clones who are, by the way, so fun to watch, uh, including the guy with the sunglasses that has become an amazing meme. Look at that, that's all of them. Uh, first of all, Corporal Wayne Fleet gets his own page because that's how prominent he is. And by the way, I'm so relieved that he's not dead. He will be back in the sequel and he will say ura again. So the guy with the sunglasses is officially named Mansk. Sorry, M-A-N-S-K, Mansk, Mansk. That's him. I just think James Cameron's parodies of military culture are so funny. Uh, they have a, a patch on their armor that says Deja Blue and it says, we will tread on you. Wonder what that's referencing. Just look at this photo of, of uh, General Francis Ardmore. I'm excited to see her again. She was fun. And what would an Avatar Visual Dictionary be without a photo of our freaky little white boy with dreadlocks? That's the guy. Anyway, I don't know. I could look at this for hours and I have.